So hello and welcome everyone. My name is Monica. Um, I direct the Include DC program here at the co-op. And this webinar is part of our series on early childhood inclusion. Um, and this webinar is going to focus on environmental adaptations. Um, this webinar is also being recorded. So if you have colleagues who you'd like to access it, they can um, download the recording once we're finished and watch it on demand. And I will make sure that you get the link to that after we're finished. So since this part is part of our webinar series that was developed by the DC Special Education Cooperative, we always like to start with what is the co-op because not everybody who joins us for these sessions um, in, interact with us in other ways since these sessions are open to the broader DC community. So the co-op is a very small nonprofit charter support organization here in the district. Charter schools elect to become members of the co-op so their staff can access all of our support services and our resources. And then at the co-op, our vision is that all students with disabilities in DC receive a rigorous, individualized, and inclusive education that prepares them for success. Uh, and we work with the charter schools to make that vision a reality. So we do this in many ways, including professional development and training on site, in person, and through webinar like this one, through resource sharing and technical assistance on special ed policy and practice, and also by facilitating collaboration with the OSSI, the Public Charter School Board, and other city agencies. One of the co-op's many programs is Include DC. Include is a course that we designed for general education teachers to help prepare them to work in inclusive classrooms. Include is a course that can be taken for graduate credit through Trinity University. Uh, and last year, we launched an early childhood focused cohort of the course through our partnership with Fight for Children. So we've just started our third cohort and plan to run another in the spring semester. Um, and thanks to Fight for Children's generous support, we are able to create this webinar series on early childhood inclusion. And this one is the third in a series of eight webinars that are based on the curriculum from our Include DC course. Uh, include DC course. So the Include DC curriculum incorporates several evidence-based practices for inclusive classrooms. The curriculum is also very closely aligned with the quality indicators in the Inclusive Classroom Profile Observation and Rating Tool, or the ICP that you see on your screen in front of you. The author of the ICP, Elena Sokoku, designed this tool so that observers could use it to rate the quality of a classroom's inclusive practices based on certain indicators. Um, so our key areas of, in of inclusive practice are based on those indicators and are listed here. So you can see them on the screen. Um, the first key indicator is classroom climate and community, which was the topic of our uh, most recent webinar. We also look at how teachers adapt space, materials, and routines in the classroom so students have access to the curriculum. We look at the ways in which adults provide support and guidance to students during learning and play activities. Also, students with disabilities may present with behaviors that are challenging, so we look at the ways that teachers assist students in solving conflicts and how positive behavior is supported. And finally, we focus on providing feedback to students with disabilities in supportive and productive ways, and also collaboration and communication among the school team and families. Um, so in this, motion, in this session, we are focusing on some of the ways that teachers can adapt space and materials um, to provide access to students with disabilities. Okay, so our guiding questions for this webinar are what are environmental adaptations and how can teachers make changes to their classroom environment to create a more inclusive space? So some of this is a little bit of repeat from our earlier webinar if you participated in those. Um, so we're going to go through these pieces pretty quickly. Um, but we want to kind of set the tone for the rest of this webinar. So when an individual classroom is inclusive, all teachers in the classroom have shared responsibility for all students. This means that in a co-taught classroom, the general and special educator are equals and are teachers of, of all children. So it's not just a shared classroom, it's a shared space. Um, and we really want to make sure that we're bringing your attention to these inclusion basics so that we are all working off the same definition of inclusion. 
Um, these are a few of the fundamentals in our vision. So first, teachers are sharing responsibility. Um, second, the classroom activities are designed so all children can access the curriculum. Students aren't just accessing, but they're also receiving individualized supports. Um, and then finally, students with and without disabilities are educated together. Um, so children with disabilities are participating in meaningful ways with their non-disabled peers in, in all the classroom activities. Uh, in our vision, inclusion isn't just about the location where services are being provided to a student, um, but it's about an approach and a mindset. So I've highlighted the second one down because it's the most connected to what we're going to talk about today. To us, this means that the curriculum and the structure of the classroom are designed with the goal of being accessible to all. So this means that activities are not always adapted after the fact to be accessible to students, but that that adaptation is built in from the beginning planning stages, so student access is as seamless as possible. In recent years, there have been many organizations and agencies, including the U.S. Department of Education, that have put out position statements um, about the positive effects of inclusion in early childhood. We all know this is a good thing. But many of these reports and studies are encouraging um, school districts to move towards early childhood inclusion, but still acknowledge that there are significant barriers and challenges in place. In our work with schools, we sometimes find that there are belief barriers to inclusion that we have to break down in order for teachers to really understand and embrace their role. And if we're asking teachers to do more, we need to make sure that they are bought in and prepared and have all the resources that they need. So again, we just want to highlight the one here that is most connected to what we're looking at today, which is environment and that the environment can shape human behavior. As teachers, we can get very territorial about our classrooms, but to create an inclusive space, we have to be willing to make changes to that classroom setup, to the structure, and to our instructional practices. So let's talk about environmental adaptations. What does this really mean? Environment is pretty much everything about the classroom, the space, the items on the walls, what's going on around the children. So it can be really broad. And depending on where you, where you look for information about environmental adaptations um, and who you ask, you might get some different answers and some different suggestions. So today I'm going to talk about environmental adaptations in these three ways. Um, as changes we can make to the classroom space, so moving furniture around, changing the layout of the room. Um, we can also talk about adapting, adapting the environment as bringing in or modifying materials or equipment that can support a child's participation. Um, for example, special posi positioning seats that might help a child sit during circle time. Um, and then finally, changes to the temporal environment, so the time that is spent on various activities or the transition between classroom activities. Environmental adaptations are important because we're trying to create access for students with disabilities. Young children are learning through their senses, so we need a space that they can interact with, that they can see, touch, hear, smell. They need to have opportunities to engage with their, with their environment. This kind of accessibility where children can in, interact and engage with their environment is going to create more opportunities for independence and learning. We know that environment influences behavior. Even as adults, we are much more productive and available for learning and getting serious work done if we're in a space that we feel comfortable in. Um, the lighting, the what's on the walls, what's around us, the temperature, all of those things can impact the way that we behave even as adults. Um, moving over, we know that all young children need smooth transitions and routines to feel safe in their environment. Safety and security is key for learning in the early years. Students don't take risks if they feel like they're in an unsafe environment, so they're not going to be open to learning and trying new things and exploring new materials. So it's a little bit about why the environment is so important. So the first step in adapting an environment to make it more inclusive is to make sure that the classroom is accessible. That means that students can get around safely without adult interac interaction or intervention. It also means that students with disabilities can access materials without adult help. 
and that students with disabilities can participate in all aspects of the classroom. So there's not an environment, uh, not a part of your environment that's off limits to a student with disabilities just um, due to the fact that they have a disability. So if you're in an accessible classroom, you're going to see some common things happening. You're going to see that students are accessing materials on their own. They can reach the bins, the ones you want them to at least. They know where things go and how to get them and clean them up. Um, two, students can get around without adult intervention. So if you have a student with a physical impairment that uses a wheelchair or a walker or a crutch, um, that child can get around the room. They can uh, move between spaces, they, there isn't anything in their way that's going to make um, it dangerous or inaccessible. So ramps if you need them, wide enough pass-through areas into your center and play areas. Um, all children should be able to reach the play food in your imaginative play area. So just making sure that there are no limitations on what students can do based on um, the physical space that your, that your classroom occupies. So now we'll get into a couple um, specifics about adapting space and materials in the environment. Young children with disabilities, and a young child, right, may have some trouble participating in group time on the carpet. Um, if a student has some sensory needs or difficulty keeping their body in a defined space, you can adapt your carpet by using tape to map out squares um, or using placemats, which I really like because they provide a tactile, um, a tactile cue as well as a visual cue for a student. Um, can be useful in the whole group gathering area and also in small group areas. Um, we often, I think it's pretty common as teachers to have defined spots on the carpet for, um, for circle time or for whole group activities, but we don't always think about how that might translate into small group areas or play areas. Um, there might be some students who need that defined space even in a very small, um, small group environment. Another adaptation would be to create accessibility would be making sure that your materials are accessible to all students. So that might include removing the lids from the bins um, or using larger handles or knobs to open bins. If you have a student that has low muscle tone or some fine motor delays, you still want to make sure that they can get materials without your help. Um, the, uh, you know, if you think of, if I take the lid off the bin, great, like that, that's good for everyone. Um, you want to be creating situations where it's not accessible, where, where you don't have a case where something in a bin might be accessible to one student because they can get the lid off, but not to another student because of their disability if they don't have the strength to open that bin. Um, another example might be even using the faucet in your in your room. If you have a sink in your room for hand washing and you have a student that can't turn on and off those knobs by themselves, so finding a way to attach um, pliers or an extended handle so that a child with some physical disabilities would be able to still independently turn on and off the faucets without help. Um, so this is kind of where we might take a cue from a Montessori classroom where everything is designed at child level and for independence and accessibility by children. Another adaptation in this realm might be removing distractions. So taking extra materials out of a center area if they aren't being used, moving toys or desired objects out of sight during group time, um, things like that. So other areas where you might need to adapt to create access for all students are in your library corner. Um, a lot of students with, with um, motor de delays might have trouble uh, turning the pages of a book. So on the top there is just a, one example of a way that you can adapt a book um, by attaching popsicle sticks to make them easier to turn pages. Um, you might also find or create special paintbrushes, crayons, or pencils that allow students to grip them. If you have students that can't hold a regular crayon or a brush, you can find these specialized items or use things like a tennis ball or a ping pong ball to help create a grip. Um, so these are really small things that you can have on hand in the classroom as needed. And again, it's just a way to make sure that what's accessible to one is accessible to all.
So there are a lot of reasons why you might need adaptive furniture for a student in your class with a disability. Students with physical disabilities or sensory needs might need special positioning devices in order to participate in activities. Um, some typical items you might see um, might be a very specialized item on the top left is um, a Riften positioning chair. Across the bottom we have, I think it's called a backjack chair, which is very useful for students that have trouble sitting on the carpet. Um, then there's a cube chair, also useful for helping to position a student who has trouble sitting um, on the floor or needs a defined space to attend to an activity. Uh, you can also incorporate seat choice, so ball chairs, bean bags, seat cushions, all, all kinds of things like that. The last item here is an accessible sand water table. Now, you don't necessarily need to find an expensive customized item like that, but it's the type of thing you want to be thinking about to make sure that all your students can access, um, particularly those who use a wheelchair or need to be seated for those types of activities. Um, just thinking about how you can make sure that the, even those very specialized areas of your classroom are open and accessible to all of your students. Another basic strategy that is critical in an inclusive early childhood classroom um, are visual supports. Students typically developing um, who are between three and five years old are going to have a wide range of language abilities. But because young children are learning through their senses, one way to make sure all your students can understand what's going on is to communicate to them through those senses. So anytime that you can pair visual support with language um, is, a, is a great, effective, and very simple way to the inclusivity of your classroom. The number one must-have in every early childhood classroom is a visual schedule. There should be one that can be used for the whole class um, or and one that is adapted for an individual student who may need more support. And this is kind of an, an important point. I've seen a lot of classrooms that have visual schedules across the very top of a, of a whiteboard or kind of down the side of the doorway. Um, and it's really important that this visual schedule be at student eye level. So the example that's on this slide here is from a classroom and it was at the very bottom of their whiteboard so that when students were sitting on the rug, they would be able to see the visual schedule at eye level. Um, and it's also using actual pictures from the classroom to help students understand what, what that component of the day looks like. Um, it's also something I think we, we skip sometimes but can be really critical for students with disabilities um, is to be able to cross off, turn over, or move an arrow throughout the day so students can see where they are in the day, um, where they are in the routine. That's a, a great way that visual supports can help students who might be overwhelmed by the enormity of all of the things that go on in a typical um, preschool day. Other ways to use visual supports include picture cards that you pair with specific instructions, um, pictures on shelves and centers to show where things go, all of these pretty typical things that we're going to see in, in most early childhood classrooms. Um, and then the example there on the top is a more um, individualized system for having a visual cue to help with all of the different classroom instructions that you might have in a typical day. And just some more visual support examples um, can also include hand signals or sign language for the typical questions or requests that you get in the classroom. A lot of classrooms will use the sign for bathroom or for water. Those are all great ways to, um, to be more inclusive and pair a visual with a verbal instruction. Visual cues can also be good ways to remind students of classroom expectations and rules. Um, and of course, using auditory signals like chimes and music is always good because you're, um, it's auditory, but it's not the same as processing um, verbal language. So all of these are, are things that you typically see um, in an early childhood classroom that are really um, pieces of an inclusive classroom that we don't think of them that way, but they are really um, helping to move that classroom to be more supportive for all students.
So I just have one short note on adapting the temporal environment. Um, your routines and transitions should be consistent, right? That's important. We don't want to be changing everything every day um, because this comes back to that need for the safe and predictable environment, which all students benefit from, and particularly those who have um, a developmental delay or disability. So both typically and atypically developing need those smooth transitions to be comfortable with exploration and academic risk-taking and all that good stuff. Most of what makes good routines and transitions isn't specific to inclusion or students with disabilities. It's just good teaching. Um, things like having cues and a clear process for transitions between activities that appeal to the different senses, like I mentioned in the previous slide, music, chants, hand signals, all that stuff. Um, that's part of any early childhood teacher's magic bag of tricks. Um, so in an inclusive classroom, all of these transitions and regular classroom routines exist, but the difference is that they're flexible and can be adapted for children with disabilities. Um, so this means that if you have a student with a developmental delay who does not stop playing and come to line up when you signal the class, your routine is a little bit flexible and you're going to use additional cues, more advanced warning, more time, or another strategy to help that child line up. Um, also considering the setting for how you provide instruction, right? So one major challenge in early childhood uh, is keeping everyone engaged during the whole group. You know, it's a, a common problem in any classroom. Um, so an environmental adaptation might be to shorten your whole group time. So if you have students who can't attend or are uncomfortable in that large group, you can shorten that large group time and then use additional small groups throughout the day to get all of those to get at all those objectives that you would have done during your circle time. So I know that one kind of like blows people's minds because we have our schedule and we, we have a lot of things we're expected to accomplish in a day. Um, but if you start to think about how how useful is that whole group time if you're doing whole group activities and it's 20, 25 minutes, you know, going on and on and you're losing a lot of students during that time, um, particularly your students with disabilities, they're not getting anything out of it. So it might be worth shortening the whole group time to just five or ten minutes and then picking up those other pieces throughout the day when students are able to be more engaged in smaller groups. But wait, isn't this all just good teaching? Yes, I get this question a lot from experienced educators. Isn't most of what we just shared rooted in common sense and doing what we instinctively know is good for children? So my answer is yes, absolutely. This is just good teaching. Much of it you probably already do on some level. So that's good news because it means you're most of the way there. But to me, the key difference here is in the proactive planning based on specific needs of students versus reactive solutions to a problem that is presented in the classroom. So to become more inclusive in your practice, it means considering the specific needs of your students with disabilities in your planning so you can intentionally create a classroom environment that is accessible to all. So you might be doing these things because they feel right and it seems like a good solution to a problem, um, but once you start to shift your thinking to, I'm doing this because I know this group of students, individual student has a need, and if I build this into my routine, it's going to make the day more accessible to that child and more meaningful for that child. That's when you're making that switch from you know, good teaching to real meaningful, purposeful, inclusive practice. So as we start to wrap up this session, we have a few questions for you to ask about your classroom environment. These are questions that can help you start to create an action plan for making small changes. So the first, can all my students get around my room without my help? That is kind of the baseline here, right? Is your room physically accessible to all students? Uh, the second one, can all my students find and use materials? Is everything that should be accessible to students accessible to students? Is there anything that your student with a disability isn't able to interact with or, um, or get to or access? Do I have any areas that my students with disabilities can't access that others can? 
So is there a center in your classroom where your student with disabilities just can't participate for some reason? Are you using a picture schedule? Can your students see it? Are you queuing your transitions for students so they know what's coming next? Do you support all students with transitions? So are you putting flexible routines in place, um, building on to using strategies to, to be flexible with transitions for students who need that additional support? And then finally, am I willing, and I might put in um, parentheses here, or allowed to make changes to schedules, routines, and transitions? Um, a lot of schools have a pretty, um, a, I don't want to say, well, strict, rigid, I guess, a rigid curriculum or or schedule that, that has to be that way because you've got a lot of kids that need to get on the playground and a lot of kids that need to use different um, spaces and materials in your building. Um, so it's sometimes hard to make changes to your schedules and routines, but that's really key to having an inclusive environment is being able to make those adjustments that are going to benefit your students. So what is next? Um, I'll stop at the end and, and answer some questions if there are any, but I wanted to um, give you some next steps and some resources. Uh, we have um, our next webinar in this series is going to be on adult guidance and scaffolding, uh, and that is coming up in December. We're also having an early childhood strand at our PD day for, um, for special ed teachers and general ed teachers uh, in December, on December 7th, and the focus is going to be on addressing challenging behavior. We'll have um, another cohort of our Include DC course, which is the intense course that takes these topics and dives really in depth, um, starting in probably February. And so we'll release an application for that program in November. And just a couple links for further reading. Um, NACI is a great place to go find lots of information about early childhood. Um, that link there is to a specific article about inclusion. Um, and then, as always, join our Include DC mailing list, and we will keep you up to date on uh, registration details for this webinar series and other events um, and trainings that are available. The handout for this session was uploaded to the documents, so you can go ahead and download a copy of the materials um, right now while you're on the webinar. And so I will stay around if anybody has any questions. Um, if you don't have any questions, you are free to drop off. Um, again, the, the link to the recording will be available. My email is up there on the screen. Please reach out if you think of anything. Um, so if you have no questions, have a great day. Thank you so much for spending the last portion of it with me. Um, and if you do have questions, then I will stay on the line and you can go ahead and either type it into your chat box or raise your hand and I'll take you off mute. Thanks again. <laughs>